this is a topic that I was that I was encouraged by doing a couple of uh, consulting projects where I had to take over projects from people that were building their first Drupal website. So how many of you consider themselves as a beginner in the Drupal? Oh, that's, the oh, that's, that's good. <laughs> that's actually good. Okay, so um, I will try to, to cut down the, the, the mistakes that you can do on your first Drupal project, uh, project and uh, it will go from the least uh, harmless one to the most uh, harmless one. So, um, my name is uh, Istvan Smoj, I'm from uh, Slovenia um, and uh, I consider myself as a web architect which means that I design web pages and then I develop them or build them in, in Drupal also teaming and CSS, uh, also active in, my, in our local community. Um, so, the countdown. Uh, I'm going to begin with, uh, with the, obvious, the obvious one, but you're already here, so this is very important because you need to, I mean, for me, uh, when, I, when I start working with, with a developer who is not He's not engaged in the community, or he's not visiting Drupal camps. He's not, you know, following the right people on Twitter. I find that very difficult to understand. Or I know that there is something wrong, not with him, but he, there must he must have some some um, work methods that are not, you know, not in sync with Drupal. So the first thing that you need to do is to really get involved in visiting uh, Drupal events, uh, start communicating on Drupal.org and you know just read blogs. There is so many resources that, 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 that you can follow. And um, there are groups, there are forums, uh, you probably have where whenever you live you have your local user group. So try to blend in. And as for any work you should put yourself, so you have to work with your heart, so that's also something very important. Mm -hmm. the, other, the other thing is that if you came from, from another system, you usually try to, you know, use Drupal as you used, I don't know, uh, sorry, uh, as you used Joomla, WordPress, or, I don't know, your own system. You always try to use those methods, those, uh, um, those, workflows and try them to implement it into Drupal. I mean, at, at, at that point, is the safest thing is to do is just to reset everything you know about your previous uh, CMS and start from zero. Even though you think, you know, I'm a, I'm a PHP developer, I know everything, but yeah, I mean, those, uh, that knowledge will come in handy, but first you need to understand the, the ground <coughs> zero level. Mm. And usually when you try to bend something, it usually breaks. So you're not Neo, right? You cannot just put it back. Um, the next thing is, the, is the, for example, I'm, I'm considering that you are also developer and website architectures and, and uh, designers and everything in one bundle. And the first thing I noticed that, for example, if you're working on a team and that, that team is not familiar with Drupal, they will try to to make uh, architecture that's not that's not that doesn't really fit into Drupal. So, for example, in Drupal we have content types, we have taxonomy, and we have a bunch of modules that can really, you know, use the power of I don't know. For example, we have views, we have um, organic groups, and with all that stuff we can connect together, and we don't need to we don't need to write on our own our own uh, let's say. Uh, database structures and so on. And but those who design uh, design the website structure need to need to know what, what the actual default structure is and build on that. So uh, for example we have a lot of cases when uh, people are trying to, to, to create different content types because it's so fun to create a new content type. But in I don't know in a couple of months you realize that you build so many content types that you just have to fork all of your all of your work. So for example, if you have a front page uh, uh, new articles, you know, and you you would only need an article uh, content type, 
Now you have like some five, you have blog, you have article, you have press release, and then all of a sudden you have to you have to do exceptions for each of those each of those uh, content types. But maybe in one smart way you could just merge them into one. That just one example, and there are many of them. Um, and but maybe the most important part is when when you when you decide on something, try to be consistent. So if you if you have some kind of your own logic, even though it's not maybe the best, try to stick stick to it and not to use different logics all over all over the way because people who are who will be working after you, they will understand maybe one of your logic. But if you have different all over the place, they might get just confused. Uh, also in the uh, in the in the process of designing of making the architect the architectural uh, design, it's very it's very neat to have to know what Drupal outputs by default. So this is this is example good for for uh, all uh, who designed it, websites for Drupal. Uh, usually the 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 most uh, the most obvious use case is, for example, tabs. Uh, I don't know, they're not here, but you know Drupal has tabs, and first the first encounter that you have with the tab is, for example, when you log in. So there is a login, and you have user login and forgot your password, and Designers don't design tabs, so they they, they stay the, the the ones that are default, and they look crappy, right? So, whenever you have a designer working on a project, uh, here's a very good link uh, from this company, Chapter Three. They have a very good blog post about uh, like a like a boilerplate that you can give to your designer. Uh, this is his template, and he has to design all those elements. And you can just reuse them all over the website if you're a teamer or front-end developer. This is very important if you want to have really nice looking, uh, consistent uh, website. Then, when you are doing the front-end development, uh, I saw this many, many times, that uh, front-end developers tried to, to target some specific classes or IDs or maybe not too specific, this is really you just have to go to the old site uh, and uh, get the context of the CSS targeting. So, for example, uh, writing a CSS rule for views slash content will actually target every view on your website. That could be, I don't know, hundreds of views. And so that's that's kind of it's kind of useless. But you have to you have to get to you have to understand. What, for example, each of the module outputs, and then <coughs> try to have I don't know a plan for that. So you you you, you target, for example, uh, you, so you write your, your your CSS in a way it can be modular, it can, it can be reused, and so on. And there are a couple of uh, there are a couple of classes and the markups that are reused all over all over Drupal, and if you target them. It's kind of useless. and then you end up with you know important all over your CSS files, which is horrible. Uh, to get I mean, to to get the job easier, so for example, even even in the CSS, uh, sometimes you have to you just have to override some template files. And the first thing I noticed that nobody really in the beginning understands how how do I know which which template file. And we have to use. I mean, one of the ways to go into your to go into your module and find a template file, put it back in your in your team and override it. But we have a couple of uh, tools. For example, for the for the templates, you have the uh, use uh, developer teamer. It creates a user interface when you just click on a, on a markup element and it shows you there's the right at, at the top. It shows you which templates are the candidate for that markup, which is great in the beginning because you don't have a clue which of the templates you have to override. And then for development, <coughs> then you have to print out some objects or arrays. Again, with develop, you have uh, DPM, and you put your variable in there, and you can have really nice, you know, nice interface to go through your object and some stuff with. Uh, how do you log in? Uh, sorry, how do you lock your, your errors and so on? 
Um, the next example is the which I saw many times because it's your first project, so you try a module and you see that it's not really working for you and just leave it there, right? Enabled and the folder is still there, you don't really delete it and everything, which is which makes that kind of mess. And when the next developer comes into the project, he doesn't really know which of the which of the modules are not in use, so you end up having, I don't know, maybe one time, I mean, if you just have too, too much uh, too much modules that are standing there, which you don't really need. And uh, you can just make it more confusing. Um, so when you are doing uh, your development, it's, it's very important that even though we are we are doing the front-end website, so we are doing the website for, you know, for the visitors, but again, we are building a CMS in behind. So Drupal, it's not really a CMS, it's a, it's a framework, so it's a content management framework. And developers are the ones who are building the CMS from it. So if, you, if, if someone says, you know, that, that Drupal looks, doesn't look so good as, as WordPress, it's actually your fault, because you didn't, you didn't optimize the user experience for the back-end user. And uh, this is usually, I mean, on, on many projects I saw that, that uh, there was no, no effort put into the back-end optimization. I think that today there was a session about that, and I think it's actually very important because this makes uh, Drupal more attractive to users and easier to sell, if you want. Yeah. Can you give some examples? Of what uh, so, for example, here we have a uh, uh, group field uh, for, the, for the tabs. Uh, it makes, for example, if you have really a lot of fields, Sometimes it makes sense if you group them into fields, uh, field set, sorry. And uh, you can also group them like here in this example in tabs, uh, vertical or horizontal, and then what else? Um, for example, you can also just, <coughs> it helps if you just uh, create a new menu for your administrators. So they don't have to go and use the, which is, which is not really meant for them. This is meant for the developers. You have to you have to create your own user experience for your editors. For example, for for my sites, I always have this uh, this uh, toolbar, which is custom made. But I put the links to the configurations or the contents that I that I want that my end user, sorry, my not my end user, but the site editor use uh, edits or something. So, well, let's say that. Your client, so the site editor, doesn't need to know what how Drupal works. So he just needs to know how your CMS works. And your CMS is based on Drupal, but that doesn't mean that uh, your client has to has to understand Drupal. He shouldn't. Really. Um, well, another example is uh, kind of the same as the first one, but this. Uh, this is more in, 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 the, in the point that you have to understand where Drupal is going. So for example, right now uh, we know that Drupal is going to release probably in the, beginning, in the beginning of next year. So maybe if you have a client that really wants to build something that would last for around 10 years, I don't know, just an example, maybe you can advise him to wait I don't know, for half a year and then start building on something, and, you know. And for example, you have a you have a feature on the website that you know that someone that somebody is building a module for that. Maybe you can you know start uh, helping them or just wait with that feature or you know, anything like that. Uh, because uh, usually there is a module for for editing, and usually there is also something that what you what you what what you are doing right now there's probably a chance that somebody is already working on it. And I mean, it happened to me a lot of times that I was developing something, I used, let's say, uh, did some custom development on it, and then in, I don't know, the next few weeks, I just realized that someone just published a module that did exactly the same thing that I was working on. And this is not a good feeling, right? <laughs> um, 
there you have a, just a couple of, of, uh, of uh, links and you can just Google, for example, Google about Module, uh, module Monday. They have very good presentations. You can follow like old Drupal on Twitter and so on. Um, the next one is using the default block system. So usually, so if you go to structure and blocks, you have this page where you can pull your blocks into regions. This works okay if you have really minimal minimal requirements there, side, right? But imagine yourself having, I don't know, hundred blocks, and this this uh, structure becomes very clustered. So you cannot really have the the view where some blocks are being called. What the you know. Well, and actually, you have really small. Uh, you don't have enough. You don't have enough uh, room for that to operate. So there are two there are two alternatives which enhance the block system. One is, one is context, which is actually just the block system with more a bit more uh, criteria. <coughs> so you can say display these blocks on this content type, display these blocks on this path, display this block on this path for that kind of users. And then you have panels which are even even more, more advanced and they're meant for building the structure for, for your website. So the point is that the default block system will be, I mean, is usually just uh, too simple to use on your, on your website. And uh, then when what it happens that um, beginners <coughs> see that there is a block uh, system and they want to display some block for some criteria and they start typing uh, PHP into the criteria because you have a you have actually have an option to, to type your own PHP to display your block for a certain context but writing PHP in, in, in the database is just plain wrong, right? Mm. <coughs> this one is this one is very nice because probably this one came from all the other CMS systems. So you have about us page. What do you do? You do page minus minus about, right? Just wrong. And I see that. I mean, I saw that on a, on websites that were you know <coughs> hundreds of sub pages. And for each of them, they had a new template because what did they had? They had this their own workflow, and the workflow was, was good for the previous <coughs> system. So and it, it was some, it was uh, something like that. So the designer made the mockups. They had someone to to create a HTML and CSS, and they and they they tried they 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 used that HTML in Drupal. But the problem was that they had to. <coughs> They had to duplicate all the content, so uh, using specific uh, pa uh, page uh, templates for the, each of the subpage. Um, you can you can easily use panels. You also have context layout, uh, but you know I would just recommend using panels because because context layout is again almost the same thing. You still have to do your you still have to duplicate some to code. But panels is a uh, user interface and uh, you can, for example, build your own flexible panels with, uh, with, an, with, the user, with the user interface, so that's nice. <coughs> so when, do you, when you do coding, um, it's good to respect the coding standards that are, that are displayed on, the, on, this website, on, on this page. Coding minus standards. Uh, you will have to you have you will have to code by the by those standards if you want that your module comes into Drupal.org uh, repository. But you know since you're beginners, probably this won't be the the first thing that you would do. But it just looks nice, and um, after you go after I don't know five years back to your to your Drupal website. You just find it easier to understand the code if it follows some kind of uh, some kind of rules. And for example, if you work in a team, if everyone uses the same coding standards uh, standards as uh, Drupal. Uh, all the Drupal modules work, uh, are uh, respecting. That just means that 
easily you can you can you can understand you can more easily understand your coworkers uh, code. Um, then the the other thing that I uh, I encountered a lot that for example hard coding uh, links hard coding URL paths uh, for almost for almost anything that outputs uh, HTML, there is there is a function in Drupal. So for example, you have a function to output link. I mean, you would say, what, why would I need a function to output a link? I can just you know, type my own HTML, uh, href. But <coughs> in the example of the, of the link, for example, if, if your alias uh, changes, this function will acknowledge that and change the link using the right alias. If you use your own code, your own markup, uh, you would have to do it manually, I guess. So this is the <coughs> Drupal API, uh, Drupal API functions, uh, which is really nice to, to, to understand. And uh, there is a, uh, there is no uh, URL here, but I think it's api.drupal.org where you can search for functions and when you get when you get the hang of it it's really simple to find find stuff that you you would normally use so whenever you have a challenge that you need to write write your own code so your own markup so for example uh, having a list of uh, an order at least right there's a function I mean there is a there is a team function for that um, so just check before you, you type your own <coughs> markup uh, then the, the problem is also with uh, choosing the right module uh, for, for your feature. So in some cases, if you don't really go and read the module, uh, the modules in the description, uh, sometimes you just see on a really little corner, you know, saying, okay, this module is okay, but in the long term, try, try this module because this is, this is becoming the standard, right? So really try to <coughs> really try to understand. Uh, so really try to read all of the specification of, of the module because, for example, in this case, when we moved from Drupal six to, to Drupal seven, there was a reference model in, in Drupal six, I think, which was great. But for Drupal seven, there was entity reference, which sold the referencing of the content more globally. So you can just reference anything from anything. <laughs> and if, if you would now, if at that time you would use uh, references, it's very uh, it could it could get complicated in the uh, <coughs> next few years because that module will be probably deprecated. Maybe there won't be any updates uh, update, uh, for for entity reference, so you would stay with your unsupported module. <coughs> Sorry. And then uh, this is this is a common one. So in your Drupal root directory, you have slash modules, slash uh, slash teams, and uh, in, for example, whoever starts the, their first uh, Drupal project, he just downloads the modules and puts them in there, and uh, this becomes very problematic when you want to upgrade your whole website, your whole system. Because uh, all of your all of your mods, all of your stuff that you downloaded from Drupal or from that you maybe created yourself, all for site slash default and then in the same structure, teams and modules and so on. Here have the, the, the example. This just this just means that it's easier to upgrade the whole system and uh, it makes it more clean because you have one place for for your for your custom stuff and one place that came with uh, core and whatever came with uh, DQ. <coughs> there is also <coughs> very uh, very wrong thing to do is to put logic in a template files. So, for example, mm. I've seen that people are putting. Uh, SQL queries in page TPL, SQL queries in non-TPL. I mean, this is 
this is wrong in every system probably, right? Uh, but people are just looking for a shortcut to get for whatever they want. Um, especially the uh, especially developers who come from a really you know coding background. You will see one of the slides what I'm talking about. But uh, try not to code at all actually, and try to use as many stuff you can you can get from from you know from modules or from user interface as you can. Uh, you do need some logic. For example, you have to do some ifs. You have to do some. Uh, you have to do some pre-processing. You have to alter some of the text, some alter some of the uh, I don't know strings and so on. Then you have a pre-process function, which executes before the team. And so you have a variable that you want to change. You, you can do this in process or pre-process. And then that that new variable that new variable come into your team and you, and you can just output it. So there is no logic in your team, but all the logic is in the process or pre-process. Um, now I think that you know, there's there's also there's also a very um, I mean there's also a security issue if you put queries into your template, obviously. But so now now we are after number five we are we're coming into this. Um, into the into the points that we can see that our our mistakes as a in, in our first Drupal project are becoming very uh, very dangerous for for our core project. So here, for example, we have a there is a this is the list for one website. It contains uh, 63 modules. I don't know why, but uh, 50 of them almost almost 50 of them are not upgraded to the latest version. Uh, those uh, those uh, which are red are actually security updates. So this website uh, has a pretty, you know, it has a lot of uh, it has a lot of security holes in there, and it wasn't updated for three years. Basically, it wasn't updated when it was developed. And uh, what can happen is that someone or or something can uh, can uh, can actually can probably hack into this site because. It is, I don't know, 20 versions behind behind what it's actually it's actually secure. So you cannot let you cannot let this happen, um, and you have to keep keep uh, keep updating your your website because this is the only way you can you can guarantee that they are safe. And there's another point that only an updated site it's it's just easier. If, for example, if your client wants to put more feature on it. It's just easier if you have a really clean installation. So this is also one very important stuff that you just don't cope, right? I mean, just try not. To, um, I guess that for many for many projects, or for probably eighty percent of those, let's say let's say smaller smaller size projects. You don't really, you don't really need to, you don't really need to, you don't really need to know how to write PHP. I mean, if you are, if you just know, uh, if you just know how to, how to uh, write your own markup in HTML, you can write your own uh, theme. But even that, I mean, uh, Drupal outputs a lot of its own HTML, and just knowing how CSS works, you can probably do a lot. Um, and <coughs> And with coding, there is a saying that uh, there is module for there is module for that, and so you don't need to know how to do query. You don't need to you don't need to do uh, operations. You have you have a very nice uh, module for that. It's called rules. So you set you set a trigger. For example, when someone uh, comments this content, send me a, a link. Right? You don't need a module for that. There is rules and many others actually. And there is so much things to do. I mean, there is so much uh, modules that, that really they are not so specific, but they can solve all together. They can solve your problems. <coughs> and when you do uh, when you do write your own code, 
please don't write it in uh, blocks or you know content and so on. Because uh, okay, in, in Drupal 7 it's a little bit harder to do that. <coughs> but I think that in Drupal 6 it was just it was by default enabled uh, PHP filter. Now we really have to now we have to enable a module that's that's called PHP filter. So for example, you can write PHP into your body of your web content, right? But absolutely a bad idea. Um, this also means that you have code in your in your files, and you have code in your database, and then you have views, and then you have some other some other stuff, and maintaining that that uh, all that is just it's just hard because you don't even know where to look for a bug, for example, and so on. So if you have to code, try and learn how to do it properly. And then the 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 most obvious one, which is not I mean which is very common actually. Um, people are I don't know changing the template without creating a sub team for them. They just go there and edit their CSS there. They go in into into module and edit the output and so on. I mean this this just happens a lot. Um, and it's not really beginners, you know. They, people just think that they will they will save time. Uh, even for those who are into, into this development for a bit longer, they see it as a you know as a way to to be to be faster in your work. But at the end, it's that kind of site. It's just impossible to maintain. Uh, it's impossible to upgrade and so on. And um, so this was the hacking of teams and hacking contributed modules and core. <coughs> Again, you can you can probably do the altering through the hooks and uh, by hooking into one of the Drupal functions, you can change variables, you can change functionalities, you can add your own functionalities and so on. So this is this is probably and this this one is the the, the mistake that will really affect your website. It, it won't be able to upgrade, it won't be able to, you know, to update. And uh, if someone comes after your work, uh, for him it's just impossible to, to keep track on it. So this is the top 20 mistakes I, I learned about doing the development. Yeah. <coughs> What do you think the um, kind of top mistakes are that clients make when they move from something that isn't Drupal over to Drupal? Mm. So like one example that we see quite a lot is that we get kind of clients asking for templates that they can kind of like drag and drop and kind of move the design all over the place, which, you know, we tend to think that if you plan the IA out properly and you structure your site correctly, there's less of a requirement to um, do that. And part of it relies on clients starting to kind of think in a Drupal-esque way about how they manage their content, which they don't necessarily think about from, from day one. So that's one mistake we see. But what, 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 what do you see? The mistakes. Um, some, I mean, I saw some, uh, some issues that they try to, uh, they, they try to bend, you know, Drupal to work as the previous system was. So, Usually, I don't know what kind of clients are we talking about. I mean, are we talking about, about advanced clients which really understand how systems works? Or we are talking about the clients who don't really, they don't really care how the background works. But in, in any case, they need to understand that they are on, they're using a different kind of uh, system now, which is actually more flexible, but in a way, it's, it's not working as they expected sometimes. And uh, for me, <coughs> It was uh, the easiest way to, to handle this. It was, you know, they had a feature request, and I was like, okay, we can do that, but this is a custom build. We need to spend, I don't know, 50 hours on it. But, you know, here we have an example uh, of a module that does exactly the same thing, and we need only two hours for that. And they, they sometimes try to realize that, you know, this is the money they spend on something that is just on their wish list. And uh, usually they end up with a solution that's basically the same, it's just not on their wish list. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. If we could make the next question the last one, because we're running a bit tight on time. 
Yeah. Do you think uh, Drupal 8 will see uh, number 16 move to maybe 18 or 19? The classes and IDs? Uh, sorry? Do, do you think that uh, Drupal 8 yeah. will sort of see um, the classes and IDs issue become a bit less? The number of divs that's generated? Uh, it's not the number of divs, I think. I mean, that's. I don't mind the number of divs, uh, divs but the problem is that uh, when a front end developer targets a class that's it's, it's actually used in, in some different part of the website and that front end developer is not aware of that so i i think that it's not really an issue of, of the of the too much markup i mean for me it's actually good to have so much uh, markup because it's it's easier for me to write css for it so i don't know i wouldn't say so um, there is one last slide I would like to show you. We have a Drupal camp in Slovenia in April. So you're welcome to come. <laughs> um, right? Um, so, and if you have more questions or you know, anything, you can just contact me. And do this. Thank <laughs> you.